television focused on the history of Australia from an Indigenous uh, perspective and um, has now been uh, brought into the Australian school system, which uh, notably has had almost no curriculum whatsoever on um, the lives of Indigenous Australians. So it's really been a huge breakthrough and they have a great website, which I recommend, First Australians. Um, <clears throat> six months later, the American experience of the public broadcasting service in the US televised its five-part series, We Shall Remain with each episode focusing on a key moment in Native American history. Four of the five episodes were directed by an established indigenous director, oops, sorry, sorry, wrong slide, uh, including uh, three by Chris Ayer, and people know a Cheyenne Arapaho filmmaker, uh, maker of smoke signals, uh, and one by Dustin Craig, an Apache filmmaker, along with a team of scholars with the ex expertise to help guide each of the films. The project, as the series website proclaimed, created a provocative multimedia uh, uh, event that establishes Native history as an essential part of American history. The most recent and perhaps most groundbreaking experiment in Indigenous television is the launch of uh, NITV on Asuma TV in 2009. I think I just, there we go, I missed up my slides. There's a, just a screen from that. The latest venture in the long standing and always innovative remote Arctic media collective, Igluik Asuma, uh, the group that brought us Atan Arjawat, the Fast Runner, and two other feature films. Since then, uh, also winner of the Commodore at the uh, 2000 Cannes Film Festival. Um, they are perhaps most well known because of the, the fame that they've acquired through that kind of success. Uh, their most recent film, uh, Before Tomorrow, uh, 2000, did, have anyone seen that? Did it circulate to around? Hopefully, it'll get here. Um, it was made by Arnaya, which is the women's collective in the uh, community of Agulik, and is gathering prizes on its uh, festival and theatrical run as I speak. Uh, it's a very beautiful film. <clears throat> uh, the group formed in 1990, the group of Lula formed in 1990, turning televisual technologies into vehicles for cultural expression of Inuit lives and histories, a counterpoint to the introduction of mainstream satellite-based television into the Canadian Arctic. Headed by Zacharias Canuck, Asuma engages Lula community members uh, who are uh, become all the actors in their productions. It's a completely non-professional um, cast and crew, while Brooklyn, Brooklyn born filmmaker and Asuma partner Norm Cohn leads a support team uh, in Agulik and from Montreal. Frustra frustrated by the difficulty of showing work to other Inuit communities, in 2008 they launched a groundbreaking alternative for indigenous distribution, Asuma TV, a free internet video portal for global indigenous media available to local audiences and worldwide viewers. <clears throat> Uh, including none of the communities where the bandwidth is inadequate to even view um, YouTube without destroying everyone else's access to um, the internet for about two weeks. So uh, NITV allows films to be uploaded from anywhere in the world and rebroadcast through local cable TV or low power channels or downloaded to digital projectors. The bigger story here concerns the unanticipated possibilities presented to indigenous cultural activists at moments of media innovation. As uh, Norm Cohen explained when uh, we were talking about this project, we saw the historical technological moment of opportunity for the internet the way we saw analog video in 1970 and the Atanarjua Fast Runner digital film moment in 1998. The brief window in the technology of communication where marginalized users with a serious political and cultural objective could bypass centuries of entrenched powerlessness with a serious new idea at a much higher level of visibility than usual in our top-down power-driven global politics. In 2007, internet capacity allowed us to end-run the film industry entirely and launch a video website that could take aspects of YouTube to a much higher level of thematic seriousness and see what happens. So this is a serious experiment in the history of alternate media experiments since the early 1970s, as Asuma has been from the start, helping viewers see indigenous reality from um, uh, its own point of view. So, um, in addition, so all these forms are, are clearly converging, and I, I want to just talk briefly here um, before ending about feature filmmaking. Feature film offers a different kind of practice, creating new locations for the recognition of the cultural citizenship of a range of indigenous experiences. These films often speak to multiple legacies of settler colonialism that have shaped Aboriginal lives everywhere, but that are less clearly marked in public discourse. They offer alt um, alternative and complex accountings of histories and subjectivities, a site for a counter-public articulation of a broader range of indigenous experience than the depleted repertoire of long-standing stereotypes. 
What role do these films made by indigenous people, and especially feature films, play in reconceptualizing national imaginaries and destabilizing unified national narratives um, is a very, uh, is an open question as these films are starting to circulate with much more um, velocity. Um, in the case of Australia where I work, um, the erasure of the experiences of um, what have been called the stolen generation, the um, in indigenous Aboriginal children who were removed from their families against their will by the state um, has been a really important point of productivity for the making of these indigenous feature films because those the, the, the stories of their lives have really not been told in ways that have really had an impact on the public and the making of these films, um, along with films by um, filmmakers like Phil Noyce who made Rabbit Proof Fence have helped to really shift the discussion in the Australian public sphere just as an example. Uh, indigenous filmmakers who hope to develop their own capacities, their voices and visions, as well as the social and financial capital needed to enter into feature filmmaking, face a far more complex and costly field of cultural production than the infrastructure needed by those who have been working on a smaller scale. To understand works such as indigenous, indigenously directed feature films, it is important to attend to the off-screen circumstances shaping cultural predictions, as it is to understand the on-screen narratives. These include the cultural and institutional conditions that helped bring at least some of this work into being, and the crucial role played by indigenous cultural activists and their fellow travelers to get support for the programs and resources necessary to create the kind of films that can expand, if not transform a national cinema. So in the case of a film like um, Atan Arjuad, The Fast Runner, are people familiar with that film? Now you are. Um, <laughs> okay, a very brilliant feature film. Again, won the big award at the Cannes Film. First indigenous feature film to make it to festivals like Cannes and also one just swept all the Canadian film awards, etc. Um, and when they went in for money from the Canadian government, because all Canadian films are supported by Telefilm, which is the government's arm of um, support for their film industry, and it's really um, in, a, in an effort to counterbalance the weight of Hollywood. Um, they only would allow them to go in for funding under the category of indigenous. Well, all the funding available for indigenous media in Canada wouldn't have funded even half of a feature film. So they made a big stink about it, went to the press, and the next year they got, they said, why can't we be funded? Why can't we go in for funding from telephone like any Canadian citizen and get be considered for proper funding? And so indeed the next year they did get the funding and um, fortunately the film did, you know, was the highest grossing film in Canadian history and did extremely well and won all these awards. So, um, you know, it was a really, important case in point to look at like what is the infrastructure you know they've set up these sort of designated what one scholar in Canada calls media reservations so there's this great that these units are set up but they also can segregate um, uh, and you know keep people from actually uh, entering into broader competitions for funding from various agencies and um, that it was really a very powerful example in this case um, and as it turned out telephone had said they had um, that the highest grossing films from that year, the first, the top three would all get a million dollars towards their next film. So they actually were able to get their next film launched right away as a result of that. So the histories of initi initiatives like this to develop indigenous feature films in different parts of the world were first launched in a systematic way in the 1980s with groundbreaking films by uh, Maori and Sami directors. And they were instructive as experiments in testing the limits of multicultural arts policies in the way I just described. In particular, they raise questions about the impact of culturally bounded categories of support for this form of indigenous cultural production, as increasingly these films circulate on the world stage, implicating such work in the nation's broader trade relations and political economies in which culture is increasingly caught up. <clears throat> the travels of indigenous films and filmmakers to the US and elsewhere are not only a form of cultural expansion and strength, but an ever-expanding circuit of indigenous film festivals allows them to form significant alliances with um, media makers, uh, indigenous and otherwise, across the world. And I actually just attended a, a screening in New York of uh, the most recent film by um, a very um, important indigenous director in Australia, Rachel Perkins. The film is called Brand New Day, and the ambassador to the UN sponsored a screening to which I was invited because I do a lot of work with them. I'm like, why is he screening this film? It hasn't been released yet. And it turned out that the theater was filled with um, representatives from, from all over the world, from the UN, and he wants them all to vote for Australia to get a seat on the Security Council. And um, the film has, a, you know, if you want to say, say you know, 
it's really been, you know, has a really good relationship with its indigenous people. We support feature filmmaking, so it was very interesting to see how it got deployed in that kind of circuit.